Is everyone ready? Let's get ready for chemistry! Ah! All right, so I'm going to make a video on how to do a titration experiment. Um, first thing we need to go over is what the different equipments are named. So this is a burette. You'll notice the burette has several key features. The burette has volumetric markings on the side. Okay, each whole number is a milliliter. And then everything in between is a tenth of a milliliter. So you can actually get hundredth of a milliliter out of this. Two decimal places out from milliliter. Very exact measurement. The burette has um, open and closed. You can see there's a hole inside, and so this thing is called the stopcock. And then when you open the stopcock, the hole okay, is aligned with the tube and the um, opening down here. And then when you close the stopcock, you'll notice that the hole that goes through the plastic, see that hole? That's where the liquid flows through, is perpendicular to that and so that's closed. So open is parallel and closed is perpendicular. Okay. Second thing, burette clamp. The burette clamp holds the burette. You want to make sure that the burette is snugly in between the divots in the burette clamp. You'll notice that the burette clamp um, has little divots that the burette rests in. If you clamp your burette sideways like this, it's not in the divots, it's not very stable, and your meniscus isn't going to be pointing straight up and down. You want the burette pointing straight up and down. You'll need Erlenmeyer flasks, 250 mil Erlenmeyer flask, 125 mil Erlenmeyer flask. Which one are you going to use? I would generally go with the 250 mil Erlenmeyer flask because if you use the smaller flask and you run out of space, then you're out of space and you've got to dump it all into a 250 mil Erlenmeyer flask when you could have just started with the 250 mil Erlenmeyer flask to begin with. You're going to need a funnel. You want the liquids funnel, not the solids funnel. You can tell the liquids funnel because it's got the chop the bottom chopped off at an angle there. The solids funnel has the bottom chopped off flat. Okay, The chopped off at an angle is going to allow the liquid to drain out the funnel. If you use a solids funnel, the liquid won't actually drain out the bottom of the funnel. You'll pour too much into the top and it'll overflow out the top of the burette. So the next thing we need to do is clean the burette. Now if you simply take the burette and shove it underneath the faucet, all of the water is going to roll down the burette and onto the floor. And then you'll have a big puddle on the floor in front of the faucet, and that's not very safe. People are going to walk by, they're going to slip, they're going to fall, they're going to break their necks, and then they'll be dead. So instead of jamming the burette underneath the faucet, get a beaker, fill the beaker with water, holding the burette straight up and down over the sink, pour the water into the burette via the beaker and fill it up that way. That way, if water rolls down the sides of the burette, it goes into the sink and doesn't make a big puddle of death on the floor. So you want to rinse the burette out. Remember that if you don't open the stopcock, nothing will come out of the stopcock. So you want to clean the stopcock too. I'm going to rinse the burette out, and then instead of letting it all uh, slowly dribble out the stopcock, I can turn the burette over and let it drain out the top. I want to use just a little bit of soap. A little bit of soap goes a long way. And then I can fill my burette up with water again. I don't have to fill it all the way up. Then I'm going to take this burette bristle brush here. Kind of a little test tube brush, but on a really, really long wire. And then insert bristle brush into the burette. And the wire bends, so you can bend the wire if it's the wrong shape. And then I'm just going to scrub out the burette 
with the wire brush. Nice, sudsy, soapity water. Here's the problem that everybody has at this point. How do you get the soap out? So I'm going to rinse out the bottom too. I'm going to let some of my soapy water out the bottom through the stopcock, clean out the stopcock. Then how do you get it out? Well, okay, you can dump it out. But all of that sudsy, soapy stuff is still in there. All right? So what you can do is, you can, and this works for any glassware, you can take it and you can fill it up and you can fill it up and you can fill it up and you can fill it up. And what happens is all of those bubbles will rise to the top. So if you fill it up and then you keep filling it up and you keep filling it up so that it overflows and then you continue to overflow it and overflow it and overflow it and overflow it, the suds will overflow out the top and you won't have to worry about them. So you can rinse and see how I'm twirling it while I'm rinsing it out? Always twirling, twirling, twirling towards freedom. If I twirl it, I get all of the sides. I get all the sides down. So I'm going to rinse it. Still suds in there. Overflowing on the top. Overflowing, overflowing, overflowing. Get all those suds out. Mm, tasty, tasty suds. And then I'm going to turn it upside down and twirl it. Twirly, twirly, twirling. And let it drain out. Still suds inside the burette. This might take you a while. You might be at this for a little bit. But it's pretty important that you clean out your burette because who used it before you and what was in here? You have no idea. So you want to make sure that you can get this nice and clean. But if you don't get all the suds out, then your titration is going to have soap in it and that's not good either. suds sticking to the wall of this, which I've never really seen that do before. So let's fill it up with water. And then let's take a nice non-sudsy bristle brush. And let's just let's give that one more go with a nice non-sudsy bristle brush. Kind of scrub those suds out. And then overflowing, rinsing out the top, overflowing, overflowing, overflowing. And then rinsing out, rinsing out, rinsing out, rinsing out. All right, I got it all nice and rinsed out. I'm gonna do my final rinse with DI water. So I'm gonna take the DI wash bottle and I'm gonna rinse out the inside of the burette. Remember to always twirling, twirling, twirling towards victory, okay? Get a little bit of DI water in there. Doesn't take much. Don't forget to rinse out the stopcock too, okay? Rinse out the stopcock. And then you can turn it upside down and you can twirl it and dump it out and that rinses it out too. Twirling, twirling, twirling. Now you could fill it up using the squirt or you could just take the top off the squirt bottle and just kind of dump it in there and you could do that too. What you want to do is you want to rinse this out with deionized water. So now, this is nice. Twirling, twirling, twirling. Nice and clean. Uh, except what's in here now. It's not what you want it to be. It's actually deionized water. And we're not going to put deionized water in it. We're going to put, generally, sodium hydroxide. So now the burette's full of distilled water. We don't want it full of distilled water. Generally, we're going to put the sodium hydroxide in the burette. And we're going to put the acid in um, the Erlenmeyer flask, and it doesn't really matter which way we do it unless we're working with phenothaline. If the indicator is phenothaline, we generally want to put the sodium hydroxide in the burette, and we want to put the acid in the flask, for reasons of which I'll explain later. So one of the ways to get the um, sodium hydroxide into the burette is to put it into a beaker. The advantage of the beaker is it's got a lip on it, so it's going to make it easy to pour. So I can take the beaker and I can pour it into the burette. I, I don't want to use too much. Not much more than seven, eight 
10 mils. What do I want to avoid doing is I don't want to fill this up to the 50. I'm not filling it up very much. And I'm not filling it up all the way to zero because if I did that, I'd be wasting all this sodium hydroxide. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to rinse out the burette. So I'm going to open the stopcock and let some of the sodium hydroxide coat the inside of the stopcock. And then I'm going to turn this upside down and twirling, let some of the sodium hydroxide drain out, coating the sides of the burette. Now what's in here? Now what's in here is actually sodium hydroxide, the same solution that we're going to load this thing up with. The reason I did that is because if you leave it with deionized water inside the burette, when you go to add the sodium hydroxide, it will actually dilute the sodium hydroxide and it's no longer what you thought it was. It's no longer the same concentration that you expected it to be. So the time has come to load the burette up with sodium hydroxide. How much sodium hydroxide? Everything is nice and labeled, so I know exactly what it is. They all look like clear liquids, so if I don't label it, I won't remember which one's which. I'm going to load the sodium hydroxide into the burette via the beaker, because it's got that nice lip on it. If you want, you can use a funnel. Of course, the funnel had better be clean too. So I take the funnel, put the funnel on top, take the sodium hydroxide, add it to the burette. By the way, make sure the stopcock is closed when you add the sodium hydroxide to the burette. Otherwise, it'll start pooling out down the bottom. Didn't have enough sodium hydroxide. Let's add more. Adding it directly from the volumetric flask can be tricky because the volumetric flask tends to glug and you want to be careful that you don't glug out more than you actually need. Uh-oh, I glugged out more than I actually needed. So what I can do is I can simply take the burette and then I can let out sodium hydroxide back into the beaker until it gets back down to something I can actually measure. Notice the starting volume. The starting volume is actually about 1.65. The starting volume is not 58.4. When you read the volume off the burette, you read the volume directly as it says. So this volume is about 1.65. Okay? You're going to estimate that last digit, and sometimes it helps to put a piece of paper behind it in order you can see it. But <clears throat> see the numbers? The numbers count up from zero. Okay? And again, you want to make sure that you read from the bottom of the meniscus. Okay? So, and, and then see how good of a measurement you can get from this. You can estimate between the lines. And that will give you out to the hundredths place. The burette is prepared and the starting volume of sodium hydroxide has been recorded. It is now time to concern ourselves with the other end of the titration, the flask. Into the flask we're going to put the acid, but before we put the acid in the flask, it is always a good idea to add a little bit of water. As they say, do what you oughta, add acid to water. I'm not going to use very much, about 50 mils is fine. You can see I have pre-measured out quantity of acid that I'm going to put in here, and I know exactly how much I'm using via a graduated cylinder. Remember that in a titration calculation, it's important to know three things. The volume of one thing, the molarity of that same thing, and either the volume of or the molarity of the other guy. So we must know the volume of the acid going in or we will not have enough information to actually find the molarity of the unknown solution. So I dumped my acid into my flask. However, you'll notice that there's still little tiny drops in there. Those drops represent moles of acid that we need to titrate. In order to get all of those drops of acid out, we're going to wash with deionized water, going to wash down the sides 
of the graduated cylinder. I can use as much deionized water as I want because adding more deionized water at this point will not affect the number of moles of acid that are being titrated. Because that's key. Titration is a stoichiometry problem where the moles of acid are equivalent to the moles of base. So we are going to titrate, we are going to react all of the moles of acid with our base and then we will know exactly how many moles of the unknown thing there were. Now I need to add some indicator. If you don't add indicator to this flask, you'll be titrating and titrating and titrating and, titr and wondering where is the end point? When is the end point happening? I have no end point. Why no end point? I need end point. Where is the end? You forgot to add indicator. So there are many different indicators. For example, we could use bromothymol blue. We could use... M cresol purple. There's there's tons of them. The favorite of high schools generally is phenothaline. Phenothaline is nice because it has a very obvious, very clear end point. The color change is not ambiguous at all. So we'll use phenothaline. It doesn't take more than a couple of drops. So we'll just add maybe one, two, three. That's probably two drops more than we really needed. Notice that the phenothaline didn't change the color of my acid solution. That's because phenothaline detects the presence of hydroxide ions. It detects the presence of a base. It doesn't detect the presence of acids. So it will change colors when there are just a tiny bit more moles of base then there are moles of acid. At that point, we'll know we've reached the end point of the titration. The stage is set and everybody's ready. It is now time to actually do the titration. The acid's in the flask, the base is in the burette. I have a little piece of white paper underneath the flask so I can see the color change more obviously. Okay. Going to swirl the flask with my main hand and man the stopcock with my other hand. So I'm a righty, so I'm swirling the flask with my right hand, and I'm turning the stopcock with my left hand. What I'm going to do at first is I'm going to just, I'm going to open the stopcock and I'm going to let, oh my goodness, look at that color. I'm going to let the um, base empty into the flask until I start to see that color. And now see, I'm swirling it. The color's going away as I swirl it. What happens is when you add the base to the flask, where that base has been added, there's not as many acid, there's, not, there's no moles of acid around it to neutralize it. So by swirling it, I put the moles of acid in contact with the base, and it neutralizes the base. Notice the purple color. That pinkish purple color shows you when the titration's over. Notice that I, I'm not just letting it drain in there anymore. I'm just quickly turning the stopcock, and that lets out a quick squirt of, of base. And I have to continually swirl it so that I don't overshoot the endpoint. Swirly, 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 swirly. Now, that squirt took a while to go away. Fast squirt. This squirt is taking a while to go away. I might want to switch to drops at this point. All right, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a very faint pink color here. It's not completely clear. If you get to that faint pink clear color and it sticks around for at least 10 seconds, that's what you're going for. Okay, so I'm really close here. I'm really close. So instead of squirts, I'm going to switch to drops. So what I can do is I can open the stopcock really slowly, very slowly, and I can actually get a droplet to form on the edge, on the very tip of the stopcock. And oh my goodness, see that violent sort of fuchsia color? That means I overshot the endpoint. I went too far. Okay, 
if you get this particular color, it means that you failed your titration and you have to start over. Notice that the difference between the color of failure and the color of victory is a difference of only three drops. By the time I had let three drops out of the stopcock, it had already turned that violent fuchsia color. So I can, I can get this if I'm very slow and very careful. I can get this so only a fraction of the hole is showing, allowing liquid to come through the stopcock. And that droplet starts to form on the tip there. I have a droplet of sodium hydroxide. And that is how I get one droplet at a time. Very slowly, very carefully, as I get towards the end point, one droplet and see all that pink. And if I swish this around, that's pink, but that's not as violent as it was before. And what's the difference in volume between uh, one drop? It's not a whole lot. So at this point, I'm done with my titration, I've reached the end point, the pink color is a faint pink color, and it's staying around for at least 10 seconds. I'm going to read the final volume from the burette, and then the volume of sodium hydroxide that I added is the difference between the initial volume and the final volume. So I'll just record the volume straight off the burette. Whatever it says, I'm going to record that volume. And that's how you do a titration. Now, best results do a titration three times or more, and then average your results together.